this episode, I'll speak with Dr. Jenny Susser. Dr. Jenny is a sports psychologist, and we're going to be talking about goals, failure, and confidence, among some other things. She offers really great insights and will give many practical things that you can implement right away. After listening to this podcast, I think you'll be excited to make some big hairy goals for yourself and you'll feel freer to actually go for them. So grab a pen and paper because I think you're going to want to take some notes from this one. All right, here we go. Episode 24. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony, because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Dr. Jenny Susser has a doctoral degree in clinical health psychology, specializing in sport and and performance psychology. She's a New York State licensed psychologist, a certified mental performance consultant with the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, and a member of the USOC Olympic Registry, which is the highest distinction that a sports psychologist can obtain in the United States. So a former um, high-performing athlete, Dr. Jenny was a four-year All-American swimmer and then assistant coach at UCLA, Pac-10 champion, swam on two national teams and competed at the 1988 Olympic trials. So Dr. Jenny has worked with Division I collegiate teams from UCLA, USC, and Hofstra University, individual high school athletes of all levels, and athletes of all sports and ages, professional, international, Olympic, and amateur. Dr. Jenny was also the 2012 U.S. Equestrian Team Olympic Team Sports Psychologist for the United States Olympic Dressage Team in London. Dr. Jenny takes um, and applies the tools of high performance also to the pressure of the business and corporate world as a keynote speaker and a corporate trainer. All right, that's quite the introduction. Let's just jump right in. So, hi, Jenny, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. Hey, Karen, thanks for inviting me. It's always good to spend some time with you. Yeah. So while I have you here, I know you have a wealth of knowledge and not just for my listeners, but this is for me also, because I always get something out of listening to what you have to say. Um, so, but before we really dive in, you know, you're, you were a swimmer, you coach swimming, you now work with corporate leaders, but you're also a horse person and, you know, we're the psych, the sports psychologist for the Olympic team the U S Olympic team in 2012. So can you just share a little bit about your connection with horses? Uh, sure. Um, I was uh, probably, <laughs> probably just like you, I was one of those little girls that came out of the womb trotting and cantering and jumping over the lines in the sidewalk. And, you know, um, anytime you drove by a horse, um, so definitely born horse crazy, just like most of us. And um, rode a little bit when I was younger, not very formal. Um, backyard barn stuff, um, hacked all over, you know, kind of the stuff where, okay, well, there's, there's a ditch, jump it. There's a down tree, jump it. There's a pond, swim it, that kind of stuff when I was a kid. So had all that fun stuff. Then I didn't ride for 20 years. <clears throat> And then uh, while I was working on my dissertation in graduate school, I went on one of those city slickers vacations and it had been 20 years since I'd been oh horse. And I was like, oh, I'm home again. <laughs> and that was it, right? And that was just it. And then um, I've been back in the horse world ever since that was about 8, 8 20 19 years ago. So, and I happened to find dressage. I had no idea what dressage was. And then someone was like, well, I have a great trainer. Go ride with her. This is in LA where there's like not very many horses. 
And she happened to be a dressage trainer. And I felt, oh man, I love the thinking, the precision, the uh, anal retentive nature of dressage <laughs> completely. <laughs> so, um, so it just was a really good fit. Um, I have never competed um, it, it, with horses. Um, I when once I retired from swimming and then surf racing, I said, okay, I'm just hanging at my competitive everything. And so I'm just a very um, hobbyist backyard barn um, with a really nice horse. Thank you, Meadow Larson. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, he's just super, I have, I have three great horses. Um, and so I'm just really fortunate, but they're just my big, big toys. So yeah. And I think I I first met you was online. Oh, yeah, with Rogley. With your my Andalusian. Big, yeah, your big Andalusian. That was he the first just time I met 24. you. He just turned 24 this week. Oh, my goodness. That's yeah. so, that's, I'm glad he's still around. <laughs> it's a, yeah, you know, it's sometimes you meet horses awesome. and you're like, what happened? And like, oh, nice. Yeah, that oh, was, that was, a, felt, feels like ages ago. <laughs> That was, right? That was a concept. That was ages ago. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's dive in. Uh, so there's a, there's a okay. few subjects that I thought would be fun to talk to you about. And I know that each one of these we could pull out and like do a, you know, whole dissertation on these. But the, the two subjects that come up uh, the most for, you know, with the students that I work with and, and for myself too, um, are around confidence and then around goal setting. So these are two subjects. So I'm going to, I'll kind of give you the overview and then let you just figure out where you want to dive in. Okay. So <laughs> with confidence, it seems like it's kind of, I put it in two categories that I see it. So confidence in oneself, which is connected to like fear of making mistakes and things like that. And then there's confidence, I guess, in the horse and like, fear of getting hurt. <laughs> oh my God, he's going to buck me off. Or I was bucked off 10 years ago and it might happen any moment. So those two things about confidence and then around goal setting. And I think with the people that I work with, some of them do compete, but a lot of my people don't compete. So you know, finding goals or you know things to aim for is just a little more challenging. So Go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, good. You can, you can start I actually, anywhere you want. <laughs> okay, I want to start with the goal setting um, because it'll set us up really well for the confidence piece. And um, goal setting as a sports psychologist is one of the very first things that you learn. You know, like... It, it is, you know, it is bread and butter for a sports psychologist. And it is also what I call the least sexy of all the tools, right? People just hate setting goals. It's so funny. You know, we just, we resist it. And I have all kinds of theories as to why, but we really do just our best to avoid being like all in with regards to goals. And they're so powerful, so my very first sports psychology conference that I went to when I was still a graduate student, um, I attended a lecture by one of the old timers, you know, the guys had been around a million years and he goes, he goes, you got to get your kids to goal set. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. And so he told this story about a research paper that, um, that, that was done. It was a longitudinal study. So it was over 20 years and they yeah. surveyed, um, uh, the graduating class, it was like 1972. So it was predominantly men from, I can't remember if it was Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. It was one of the Ivy League schools. So 1972, then they went back 20 years later and did a follow-up. Now, two of the questions that they asked in 1972 that were the interesting ones were, um, do you set goals was the first question. And the second question was, do you write them down? Oh. And so what they found was, yeah, right. Very, very interesting. 3% of this graduating class in 1972 said, yes, I set goals and write them down. When they went back, 
20 years later, what they found, among other things, was that the 3% that reported they set goals and wrote them down made more money combined than the remaining 97% of the class. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, so goal setting does a lot for the brain. It really, so it, it creates a level of commitment, which I think is really part, you know, the blessing curse, right? So it, it gets you aligned, it gets you focused, it gets you out of bed sometimes in the morning, but it also is the confronting part. You mm-hmm. know, like, I think that's where people go, mm, I don't really want to write down my goals, or I don't really want to set goals because I don't want to commit to them. And so that's where I always talk about the failure part. Mm-hmm. So I have a um, I have a master class on Noel Floyd, and they post articles on their um, Facebook page from time to time. And just yesterday, they posted this article called "The F Word," and it was <laughs> taking it, and it was all about failure, <laughs> and and it was all these quotes that I had about how much you actually need to fail in order to succeed. I mean, for me, I've been saying for 20 years, failure is the gateway to success. It yep. just is. You have to fail. You have to fail. You have to fail. Then, you know, we had all this research come out on um, deliberate practice, the 10,000 hours, the whole Anders Ericsson that led to um, the, the stuff that uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote about mm-hmm. Blink and everybody uses it, right? The, the 10,000 hours. And that was all about the neural pathways. So the brain science behind learning and what they found was that true learning occurs in the correcting of a mistake. Mm-hmm. So, so from, a, from a neural pathway, neurophysiological aspect, you actually have to fail in order to get better. Right. So, so I think that that's, that's one of the things that people just so bump up against with regards to the whole goal setting and committing to that process is that they think that if they set a goal and they fail, that they're done, they're over. And that is just the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, you want to set some really big, hairy goals and with your really big, hairy goals, the likelihood of succeeding should be much, much lower than your daily goals. So with, You know, like when I set a goal to make the Olympic team, you know, they take two people every four years in my event, right? And how many hundreds of thousands of swimmers are there and, you know, all the different things that can go wrong or or go right. So you set the really big hairy goals, you got to be ready to fail at those. But then there's the hundred or thousands of goals that lead up to those big hairy goals. And those are the ones where if you're failing at like a 60 to 65% or you're succeeding at a 60 to 65%, so you're failing, you know, 35%, then you're like doing really well with your goals. You should set them hard enough and we'll, I'll go over the, the format, the smarts format. You should set your, your goals hard enough that, you know, that you're going to actually fail and you should fail at a mess of them. Right. Um, and that's where I think a lot of people get really stuck with the goal setting process is that they have this, this collapsing ideation that they set a goal, they should just succeed at it. And if they don't succeed at it, then something's just irretrievably wrong with them or their. Yeah. And that's where the, the, what happens when it doesn't go well, you know, what are you telling yourself? You know, (laughs) you know, it's that judgment, the self judgment and, on all the, you know, I'm, you suck. I'm a fail, you know, instead of the instantaneous, like, Oh, well, what do I have to do next time? You know? Yeah. And it's yeah, exactly. this idea like committed, but not attached to something. I tell people like be committed, but not attached, like go for it. And then, you know, next, <laughs> okay. Now you've learned what doesn't work, which is right. so valuable, but you know, easy to say when you're sitting here on a podcast, but when you're out in the middle of doing it, um, you know, I've bumped up against these things too. And, um, th- well, you know, to not add this extra meaning onto this thing that happened, you did this, this happened. And now what are you going to do to make it better next time? Without yeah, piling you know, on all the meaning. Oh, you're terrible. You suck. You'll never do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, Those I think it's years. an acquired taste. Mm-hmm. 
I think figuring out how to be good, become good at failure or not making stuff mean it's the end of the world. I think that's an acquired taste or even a skill that you have to develop and that, that most of us don't develop early on. You know, we have a really super competitive culture as opposed to having like a collaborative creative one. Mm -hmm. And so people get into a competitive or performance mindset, regardless of whether they're actually performing in a ring or in a, in a like sanctioned competition or as horse women, we're always competing with ourselves for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we start to look next door, left and right, you know, like, are we better? Or are we worse? Or, you know, do we look better <laughs> than they do. Or, you know, then we get, then, then we get into it. And that's, you know, that, sort of the human brain and how it goes but if you prepare and set yourself up for this is a goal not a you know a prison sentence or a life sentence or a you know a personality <laughs> inventory it's a right, goal right. Uh, and so i you know the more goals you set the better you get at both setting goals and then also failing at goals which will then lead to succeeding uh -huh. and accomplishing your goals. And does this happen like as you, as you progress and go up the levels, I mean, to work with, you know, Olympic athletes and the pressure that's on them. Cause just in my, in my own personal experience, you know, there's times that I felt like I made big, bold moves and sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't. And I, it, it was all good. And then, you know, it reached a certain level and it's like, uh Oh, now I, I have to reach my goals because like I'm a professional or whatever <laughs> label or pressure I've decided to put on myself. Is it the same process? It's just the same process of, all right, at this level, at this challenge, it's still the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think once you, you know, what, depending on the level that you are, are performing at with regards to your skill set or, more importantly, how far you want to take your skill set, right? So, you know, everybody has, has, you know, their own lid on where they see their skills and whether or not that's appropriate, that's a whole nother conversation. But depending on where you are with that, then your goals are going to have um, a, sort of like a different impact on your trajectory, right? You know, so you're working with someone who's competing at a national or an international level, their goals are, are going to be a little different and, and have a little more um, repercussion to them, right? Mm -hmm. So like my goals, if I fail at my goals, I don't have a sponsor that's going to be mad at me. I don't have a coach that's going to be disappointed. I, you know, I, I don't have something that I can't now try again for another four years. And do I have the, the everything to try that again for four years, or I'm not going to lose clients um, or reputation. So, but we all have different areas, right? So if, so maybe you don't have those high pressure, intense goals in your horsemanship or your horseback riding or your relationship with your horse, but maybe you have them at work. Maybe you have them in your relationship. Maybe you have them in, in, in whatever you do at home, the home you make or keep, you, you know? So it's, 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 it transfers across the board. And, and I find that so many people develop this skill to have a powerful relationship to goal setting, failing and succeeding, that it then just carries over everywhere. Once you get good at this, you're good at this everywhere. Mm. It doesn't have to just be with your horses. Well, or and, yeah. and, and that's kind of brings up an interesting point because sometimes with the horses, I'm, I'm more practiced at having a goal and meeting it and having a training plan and things like that. But to think of, to maybe practice goal setting in lower stakes environments or you know you can make it fun like practice a goal with something that isn't as important to you maybe and just just for the sake of practicing it because it, it is it's a, it's like a, a muscle you can build and then it'll transfer yeah absolutely like that you know so to me goal setting is like a staircase 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so at the top of the staircase is the big hairy goal, whatever it is, you know, let's say, let's say in dressage, it's qualifying for the regional championships, right? Like I I love that as a goal. I think that's a terrific goal and adult amateur professional, right? That's, it's so easy to talk about that, but let's say that's your, that's your top step. That's your, your big hairy goal for the season. How do you get to that top of that staircase? Well, there's how many steps are there? Right. Are we talking about, you know, like thousand steps in Laguna Beach or who are we talking about, you know, like our backyard or maybe just a, a you know, football stadium? There's all different numbers of steps that you're going to need to take. And that's where that's really where all the work gets done. So I am if you have a big goal right? Like let's say qualifying for the regional championships, like you should be having a daily goal every time you are with your horse, Mm -hmm. whether you are playing with them on the ground, whether you're having a, you know, like a no pressure day or you take them out for a graze and a beauty treatment. Mm -hmm. um, Or if you're having a clinic or riding in a clinic or going to, you know, a camp or, you know, class or, you know, just riding with your trainer, whatever it is, you should have a goal every single day with your horse. Um, So when I ride, I set a daily goal and I have um, attached my daily goal to when I tighten my girth. Oh, interesting. So So that's so it's, yeah. So it's a really good, great, cause otherwise you forget, you kind of like, so it takes a couple of weeks, you know? And so at first what I did was I put a red rubber band around um my my girth so that every time i went to um tighten it i was like oh okay there's the red rubber band i need to set a goal for today nice right because you know you you think a thought a second every single day all day long there's a lot of thoughts that are going to go between right now listening to this podcast and tightening your girth the next time you go to get on your horse so i'm big on when when you attach new habits that you're trying to make when you attach them to existing habits Mm -hmm. then you know then you have one less thing to think about um so i love that you know if you're playing with your horse you could do it when you're when you, whatever, open the stall door, open the paddock gate, put the halter on anything. We have a hundred different things we do every single time we see our horse. So, yeah, yeah. so that's really easy. I had some people put stickies on their tech grooming boxes, you know, stuff like that. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So every single day you should have something that's guiding your behavior. And that's a great thing about goals is that they just are like, you know, even if my goal is to get off my horse with a smile on my face, mm-hmm. that is still something that I can measure. Right. Yeah. No. And I, I love that because sometimes people save the goal setting for the important stuff and then it's always pressure, but um you know, the other, if I do have the spa days, you said like, you know, the the spa day for your horse. And it's really important because I did this just the other day with a horse who's not that great in the wash stall. And I said, I'm doing a spa day. And I said, why am I doing it to just spend some non-demanding time and connection time with my horse? So now if he starts getting fussy, I can't, you know, I find myself getting impatient and I'm like, wait, no. And I actually told myself, like, the purpose of this is not to get him clean. The purpose of this is to have the, a nice <laughs> connection with him. So, you know, I have to problem solve differently. So just that remembering, what am I doing? And, yeah. and like you said, to practice that, I love that you brought that up in, in whatever moment, you know, just to remember, why am I, why am I doing this? Yeah, because when we get emotional, we'll lose track of that so easily. And if you've got a goal, even if it's something really simple, it's just going to help ground you. And mm-hmm. and that is one of the things that I absolutely love. So are you going to write down your your daily goals? Probably not. Um, I do when I am working with someone who's you know, really focused on a goal. Sometimes I'll have them write out their goal before they go to the barn or, you, you know, as you get to the barn or sitting in your car, you put a piece, put a pad in your tack trunk or on your saddle, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. You can do that. Um, the daily goals, writing them down isn't always as critical as, you know, like the qualify for regional championships mm-hmm. kind of goal to write that down. Um, so, but I thought I'd go over the, the, acronym i always say that did i say that right acronym. 
Okay. I always want to add a, a, a syllable or something like that to that. Okay, so that acronym. Acronym. Yeah, an acronym. An acronym. Like that. Something like that. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, smart goals. Most people have heard of smart goals, right? So the um, and it's ages old, and it is such a great way to design your goals. So I actually call them smarts. I add an S on the end. So SMART, S stands for specific, right? So you want your goals to be specific. So the, the saying is good goals are like good driving directions, right? If I say, hey, Karen, <clears throat> I live in Florida. You want to come visit? Sure. You go find me. <laughs> <laughs> sure, someday. Right? Even if I say Ocala. Yeah, someday. <laughs> Even if I say I live in Ocala, can you? How easy is it to find me? Right? Mm -hmm. Not nearly specific enough. Right. So, if I'm saying, "Hey, I live at such and such a street," and here's my street address, that's specific, right? So you want your goals to be specific, like a good driving direction, right? The M stands for measurable, and this is so important. If you can't measure your goal, you cannot tell if you succeeded or failed right? Yep. So specific, measurable. I want to qualify for regional championships at third level in 2021. Okay. That's specific. It tells you exactly what it is. It's measurable. Will I know if I did it or not? <laughs> okay. So SMA, the A stands for action oriented. When you set a goal that is smart, specific, measurable, what appears immediately is your action list, right? I want to qualify for regional championships at third level in 2021. There are a mess of actions I've got to take, right? I've got to get two qualifying scores. I've got to be able to do a flying change. I've got, you know, like whatever the list is, like the actions just boom, immediately emerge and you know exactly what you need to be engaged with in order to be successful. Okay, S-M-A-R, reasonable but challenging, yeah. right? So you want this to be, you want your goal to be like uncomfortably comfortable, okay? That's the realistic but challenging. So if, if I set a goal to qualify for regional championships at third level, in 2021, and I have um, a donkey paint mix who is three years old and unbroke. Is that realistic? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, not so much, right? No offense to the donkey paint mixes out there, exactly. right? But trying to be um, a little bit, you know, exaggerated here, it, it, like that's so unrealistic that it is not going to get me out of bed when it's cold or rainy or so nice that I want to go to the beach, right? So, so that's when it's unrealistic, when it's too challenging, it's, it's at, like not even possible to, to happen, then it takes you out of the game. The other thing is if it's not challenging enough, right? So if I have a Grand Prix horse and I decide I'm going to show third level, like how challenging is that going to be? Mm-hmm. Right. So again, it's not challenging. So that creates it, it, there. There's nothing to stir you. So you have to sort of find that middle ground. Right. You competed at second level last year. It was really hard to get your flying changes. And so third level is going to be challenging. You know somewhere you can do it, but it's going to be challenging enough that you really got to get after it. So that's the realistic but challenging. That's the R. The T stands for time sensitive, right? Put a date on it, I, you know, like yeah. <laughs> go for it, put a date on it. I want to qualify for regional championships at third level someday. Mm -hmm. Who cares, right? Yeah. You know, like it's not going to matter now. Okay. In horses, lameness is always an issue. Okay. So that can really mess up your timeline. But again, the other thing that I love to say about goals is that you want to write them in pen soul. Okay. Because 
Mm -hmm. right stuff is gonna happen you know like so you you go lame your horse goes lame you know something great happens something terrible happens you have to adjust your timeline ah adjust your timeline doesn't right. mean you're a failure okay so that's smart the s that i add on the end is for support because who's on your team right who do you have with you and your team when when you're an equestrian your team is much much bigger than just you and your horse right so there's you your horse there's whoever you live with right cuz whatever goal you're setting for your you and your horse is going you're to obsessed with it is going to you and whoever you live with right <laughs> there's your farrier there's your vet there's your barn owner there's especially your trainer you know, I, I read somewhere once some article, maybe it was on like Medium or something like that. And they're like, don't tell anyone your goals. Hogwash. Tell the people who yeah. are in your team, tell your support network what your goals are, because guess what? They've got to be aligned. If you tell your trainer, I want to qualify for third level regional championships in 2021, and you've only done training level, they're going to need to have a conversation with you about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And if they say whatever they say in response to that is going to be very telling about your relationship and, and the quality of your relationship. So share that with the people that you need to share that with, and then make sure that everyone is aligned. Make sure your horse is aligned. My donkey paint mix is not going to want to try and do third level. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. You, and I you, think it's important to, to think about who is your team. You know, you're going to yeah, learn about the sure. team, but also, yeah, it, you might not want to go like posting it on Facebook and get, you know, the general public's view on your <laughs> goals. So like, I think, but yeah, it's <laughs> worth it to sit down and go, all right, who are the people that matter? And that it, this is, you know, going to involve. Yeah, for sure. Them. And, but, and yeah. are, you know, and are they aligned and supportive and, mm -hmm. you know, I, shoot man i mean thank goodness there was no social media when i tried out for the olympics although my parents they they were a broadcast network of their own and every single <laughs> human being that was in their world knew that i'd failed to make the olympic team and there were there were atrocities about that but um at the same time having that kind of support was really critical yeah 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 so That's smarts awesome. you want to write them down um, create a staircase, you know, like that's the A part, the action oriented, mm -hmm. you, put, you put the big hairy goal up at the top and then you create your staircase and your timeline and milestones and the things that you want to accomplish along the way. And then the other, just two pieces to think about with regards to goals that they, they talk about process goals versus outcome goals. Yeah. And so this is where you can, so yeah, important. you can have a little bit of play, right? So qualify for regional championships at third level in 2021. That's an outcome goal, right? Getting one of my qualifying scores. That's an outcome goal. Then the process goals are the things that you have to do in order to get to that outcome. And they can actually be a bit softer, right? So you can have a process goal of like, I want to make sure that I breathe while I'm riding. That's a good process goal. A lot of, a lot of people want to increase their level of confidence or, or the way that they listen or maybe something with their hands, right? So, so the process is sort of the nitty gritty in the day. You mm -hmm. know, those, a lot of those daily ride goals will be process or will process directed to take you towards that outcome oriented goal. So you need to have both. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think those processes are, you know, well, I don't know if one's more important than the other, but, you know, the, the, if you have the process, then it's, it's kind of going to lead to something, you know, to success. Yeah. Um, and that's going to allow you to adapt. So this didn't work. If you have a process of adapting, a process of, you know, getting through that and moving on to the next day, it's easier to, not get stuck and go, Oh, that didn't work and stop you in the tracks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, you know, that's why it, people who only, a lot of times the, the only setting outcome goals can also be a big barrier to the whole goal setting process because those are like, either you did it or you didn't, you know, mm -hmm. like with a process goal of like, I, I want to feel more relaxed today. 
So let's say you want to have a process goal like that. A lot of people get stuck with the M. How do I measure that? Okay, so create a scale on one, of one to 10. You know, use a grading system, mm-hmm. A, B, C, D, E. You know, like today, I, I give myself an F for relaxation today. I was terrible. I just couldn't, couldn't relax. I was not breathing, whatever. But if you do that every day, then it'll begin to have some consistency and it will begin to reveal more and more things about that particular process, whether it's relaxation or breathing or confidence. You can measure those things with a scale of one to 10. Just use the same scale each day. Interesting. I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are, we, we all want to feel better. We all want to feel more confident. We all want to feel more relaxed. We all want to have better focus, all those kinds of things. And, and those, while those are the softer skills that doesn't make them unmeasurable, you can for sure yeah. measure those. Yeah. Interesting. I think that that's an interesting idea to, I'm going to think about that. Like how, you know, I, the scale from one to 10, it for sure is useful, but also thinking about like when I, when I'm, yeah calm with and relax with my horse, like I do smile more or I'll end up singing or, you know, I take, I take more breaks, you know, Mm -hmm. so that's one of my red flags. I know I'm getting um, too tense. If I, I notice I don't let my horse stop for as long during a break. I'm like, come on, we got, you know, and I'm like (laughs) where, you know, when I'm really in a good groove, I can, I can let them all the way down and take break and pick them right back up. And we're, right there you know so there's this like when i get into this like ah i gotta get it done i know i'm losing some of my relaxation so i think it'll be interesting to think about different ways to measure some of those process and softer yeah yeah they're totally measurable and and we you know we think well because they're soft yeah but yeah play with it i i I think you'll have a lot of fun with that and it it, especially with your level of self-awareness if you can tell oh man, I've not given my horse a break in 20 minutes, mm-hmm. or whatever it's been. And if you're aware enough of that, then that'll, that'll be a good tool. Awesome. Well, that's a, that's really cool stuff. I hope everybody <laughs> wrote that down. <laughs> right. <laughs> write it Rewind. down, man. Play it again. You write it down and hide <laughs> it from someone. That's okay. But, but <laughs> write them down, right? It does something. Writing the, the, the physiology behind writing with paper mm-hmm. and pen is extraordinary. The research yeah, yeah. on it is extraordinary, um, especially cursive. Ugh. But the cursive yeah. is really the research on that is when you're developing and learning to read and write. That's when the cur- cursive is important, actually. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I know for yeah, me, the tactile pen pen on paper yeah. has always been, for me, felt felt better, but really different between print and cursive and... Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Different, different neural pathways, brain connections. Yeah. It's, I know it's sometimes, I don't know if this is goal setting or not, but sometimes if I have tough questions, I write with my non-dominant hand and I get really different answers sometimes. Wow. I'll ask myself well, stuff and then I, and I let my other hand do the writing. And sometimes I'm like, Okay. <laughs> Where's that come from? It's I do not write well enough with my, with my left hand to oh, be able to do that. It, but I I'm, can't read it, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know what's coming out, you know? Well, you, there's some homework for you, Jenny. Yeah. You I'm going to have to give that a go. Wow. <laughs> That'll be messy. It's interesting. <laughs> it's messy and slow. <laughs> messy. Yeah. And slow. Uh, <laughs> especially in cursive. That's really hard. With the I other can't even imagine. I can't <laughs> imagine. Um, All right. Okay, so how does this connect to confidence? I mm. bet is the question everybody. Excellent is segue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> so confidence, um, interestingly enough, um, I I define confidence as an emotion. And you know, it's funny because you and, and you can try this at, at your courses, right? Ask people how they define confidence. You know, ask, ask your attendees, they, and they cannot do it. Right. Uh, It's when I feel confident. Yeah. Well, either I feel confident or I don't. Right. And so like, well, how do you define that? Exactly. Tell me, how do you know when you're confident? Well, so in my opinion, first of all, it's an emotion. And second of all, it's a byproduct. You feel confident 
when you do something successfully. Mm. It's like courage. You don't get courage right? until you do it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that that's always the interesting thing. And like confidence was actually um, one of the things I measured in my dissertation. So I have been plagued by this word for, you know, more than half my life because I was not a confident athlete. Mm -hmm. I pretended to be confident and I, I actually wound up looking quite cocky or arrogant and I was a sprinter. So it was like, you know, really kind of my shtick, but it was, it wasn't that I felt confident. It was that I felt unconfident. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, you know, last year that I discovered <laughs> <that>. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a byproduct, right? It's a result. You know, you feel confident when you're successful, which is the mm. funny thing, you know, like women are told all the time, well, you should just feel, go be confident. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. So, so just thinking about, you know, getting okay. confidence to do something new for the first time is that like a misuse of that word because maybe we can't be confident doing it if we've never done it we got to just totally. be brave you gotta be brave and yeah uh, yeah absolutely i mean you can borrow your confidence mm -hmm. from something else right so you know i'm very confident handling my horse i would not be so confident handling an elephant right so <laughs> But I could borrow from the fact that I am confident. I, you know, I did take the time. I, I went through all the steps. I have some familiarity with like what it is to hold a rope or to watch an animal. So you can, you can borrow, <clears throat> excuse me, borrow from other areas of your life while you're acquiring and learning new skills. I think that the number one thing is to have an expectation of confidence when you're doing something for the first time or while you're learning it is just ridiculous that's a ridiculous idea <laughs> to go into some, you know but adults are bad learners you know we're so bad at doing things and not being good at things you know mm -hmm. once we pass you know like puberty we're like well i gotta have this all handled now well and this is why it's so important to, um with something i do a lot is is talk about like not being afraid to mess up and to to like well let's just play with this yeah. And, you know, I tell a story of uh, um, an art teacher I had, and it was this, it was a figure drawing class, and all we had to do was show up to get the A. That's all. And there's a live <laughs> model. And, and the whole semester, I had like this newsprint, the cheap paper, and I drew with like pencil, and I drew the same freaking way the whole time. I never did the hands or the face or the feet because, you know, they're hard. And he, he only ever said one thing to me the whole semester. He'd go by me with his glass of wine in his hand. And he goes, Karen, don't be afraid to F it up. <laughs> and and I, then he'd walk along and I'd do the same kind of drawing the next time. And at the very end, he, um, he took a big red pastel and put it in my hand. And he took my hand and he just scribbled. All, and he said, don't be afraid to F it up. I'm like, oh. <gasps> my beautiful pencil drawing and then i was like oh <laughs> that's what that feels like <laughs> play with it like just like why was i afraid to draw the face or the hands or the feet like it didn't matter and yeah. i was still not confident so i think the you know to to just not be afraid to mess it up and to think of it as play well let's play let's see well, let's see what happens yeah. Again, right. easier said than done in the moment. For sure. For sure. You know, the, the thing that, that stops most women, especially is, is the lack of that sensation of confidence going into something. And that is something that distresses me terribly mm. <laughs> and it bothers me. That's the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night as a sports psychologist, because you know, it's just a myth. It is a huge myth that you should feel confident doing anything or god forbid everything so how do we get comfortable being not confident right so the first thing to do is to stop referring to it like you know like it's this necessary um imperative if you don't have it you you suck you need to shift your mindset and your relationship to it because it's 
you know, you, the way that you're relating to it isn't supporting you, isn't creating success for you, and certainly isn't empowering you. So that's the first thing. It's kind of like the goal setting. You know, you, you shift your mindset, you prepare your mind to say, okay, I'm going to go into this and I'm going to set a goal and I'm either going to get it or I'm not. And it's not going to matter. It's not going to stop me. It's going to only teach me whether I succeed or fail. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to be able to take that to the next day. That's going to help me forward my movement, get me where I want to go. Same thing with feeling confident, right? You know, like, I mean, okay, so a lot of people listening to this are either going to be in a long-term relationship or are going to have had a long-term relationship. And so you've been with Dana for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Is that okay to talk about? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, how many secrets does she know about me now? <laughs> I don't think you know too many. So go ahead. <laughs> right. And, you know, I've been with Meta for 18 years. And so if confidence is emotion, right, so is love. Right. And so I, I will tell you, I'll just be honest. And I know that Meta can say the exact same thing over the 18 years we've been together. I haven't always felt love for her. <laughs> right but it didn't stop me from being with her or engaging yeah. with her or remaining married, you know, like all of those things. So, mm -hmm. but we look at confidence, you know, like it's like, it's this weird thing, but a lot of us, you know, we go through phases in our relationship or have a fight or whatever. And mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you know, like you're really thinking that you hate them much more than you love them. <laughs> And then you get over it and you get through it and then you get up the next day and you're, you know, and then it's another day or another year or whatever. It feels and very so to um, to confidence like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just the way you're talking about it feels like, Oh, it's I'm not really... like, I, sh it, I can, I can imagine being in a situation where I'm feeling not confident and then stressing out about it and just going, wait, I'm not supposed to feel confident. So yeah. then, uh, this is perfect. <laughs> you know, there's a, I think that's a beautiful way to take the pressure off. Like, of course I don't feel confident. This is new. Even if it's not new or you yeah, know, like or it's you can just... have good days and bad days, you know, like I'm sure that there are things you do with your horse that are just like, you know, like tying sh your shoe for you. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a day where you get on your horse is like, uh, -uh there ain't no laces for you today. Oh honey. yeah. There's plenty of days. Like I feel like I can't ride at all. And then, you know, right. this past week, I've, it's been a great week and I keep, I was like, I got a magic butt this week. I don't know what's in my, <laughs> I got magic butt because all my words are going great. But then there's other days I'm like, I need to retire. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know, so a lot of it is the way that you set your mind up to go into this, you know, and, and when we started, you talked about, you know, confidence in oneself and confidence in one's horse. Right. And so if we take the word confidence out of that, and like, maybe we replace it with something that's a little bit, um, and, and maybe trust, right? Maybe relationship. You're looking for some different way to categorize or define your relationship or how you mindset, how you view yourself or, or your horse. So something that, you know, like creates an opening instead of keeps it so closed. Mm. And that, I think that that word, confidence all often keeps us so closed off from things because we have a very one dimensional unsupportive disempowering relationship to the word that really leaves us no other option other than feeling like crap mm. you know but you know we look at we look at whether or not you know you're confident in your horse well what are you really saying you know like okay do you trust your horse do you know your horse you know like horses from a a neuro physiology and neuropsychology perspective are pretty simple mm -hmm. you know like they're you know like they're they're first and foremost a prey animal right and i'm sure you talk about this all the mm -hmm. time you know like their safety first right like mm -hmm. their first their everything the lens that they see through is is that going to kill me or not you know and once they're like okay that's not going to kill me this 5 minutes it may try to kill me in 5 more minutes <laughs> right but you know those are the things so confidence in your horse really would be trust in your training trust in your ability, trust in your skill set, trust in your relationship, right? There's, there's so much more to it than that. Like, 
you know, like, am I confident that I can get a prey animal that doesn't have a frontal lobe to do something that I'm asking it to do just because I love you, Fufu, you know, like, it's just, we get so silly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think I'm going to, I'll have to, I can feel myself already thinking about the next time I have that thought of being aware of like a level of confidence, like how I'm going to reframe that. That's really interesting to me. Yeah. Like, we're, what, what could I, su- what could I substitute instead of that or to yeah. get a little more refined or um, yeah, you're right. Cause that word is, it's, it feels very binary. I'm confident or I'm not, you know? And uh, I, I think the reality is that there's these layers going on. I think it'll be really interesting next time I catch myself to kind of sit there for a moment and go, what's really going on <laughs> and it'll be different in different moments, but that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, that's sort of my, my um, general ph- philosophy around confidence, something that has, you know, when I was swimming, <clears throat> it, it was, you know, there's the late eighties when I was at UCLA and that was what sports psychologists were talking about. They were talking about that and the zone, which was impossible. You know, we're 30 years later, nobody has tapped the zone, just so we know. We have we have Mikai Chikamihai, whatever, the guy who did all the stuff on Flow State, which is awesome work. Mm-hmm. Um, but <clears throat> there is no zone that they were trying to find in the 1980s. And so really it's a whole different game. You know, the game around performance and sports psychology is, is mostly around preparation. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Now you, you goal you setting is a huge part of that. Yeah. Yep. Now you were talking about um, confidence and women, especially, and I know you are at the time we're recording this, you're getting ready to do in a couple of weeks or something, a symposium called How Women Do It, along with Meta Larson and uh, Sinead Halpin Maynard. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you're covering in that? I'm going to have to get my ticket to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really yeah. interesting. We would love it if you would come. Um, so C6 Equestrian is something that um, Meta and Sinead and I just sort of organically appeared out of the last clinic that <clears throat> that we did and the three of us did it together and it was a whole lot you know you know how these things happen karen right like they just the this, this sequence of events that you just could not have predicted or foreseen and all of a sudden you're standing there and you're like wow. what just happened <laughs> you know and, and and it was so wonderful that we were like all right we just got to keep we got to do more of this how do we get more of this how do we do more of this so our our clinics which, you know, the really the size and the scope of them warrants the word symposium because we really work hard like you do to engage everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, like I remember when I first started doing dressage and I went to a clinic and I wanted to poke my eyes out because (laughs) it was so boring. (laughs) And it was, I mean, I may as well have been sitting like outside the window with a pair of binoculars. I was so disengaged. It was, you know, I felt like a voyeur, like, am I interrupting here? You know, like (laughs) there was no, there was no me there. There were, there's my notebook and, and everybody else scribbling like mad and absorbing nothing. And so when I started doing clinics, uh, as a sports psychologist in the dressage world, I was like, okay, I'm going to make it a point to engage everyone. And so we are really good at that. Everyone gets to, you know, be a part of it. And I work really, really hard to engage everyone that is a horseless participant. Nice. <laughs> we have, yeah. Right. Oh, so a good, that, a good gallery, you know, observers or participants without a horse or they I mean I love that in my clinics they really add to the energy and if you get them engaged they're like rooting for the oh my riders God. and it just gets this really cool effect so yeah I love that yeah so so our, our clinic is going to be on energy um, our symposium is going to be on energy and the energy of confidence and connection and so these are in the 10 years that I did clinics in the dressage world. Those were the two things that 
every single person who attended and it was, you know, 90 to 95% women. And it was always, how do I have greater confidence in myself and how do I have greater connection with my horse? Mm. And so this is something that has been a passion of mine for a long, long time. And um, in the corporate world recently, I've started doing women's leadership retreats, summits, um, keynotes, and the power of having all women in a room is astounding, right? You know, like you, I've, I've done, you know, thousands of corporate presentations, you know, where there's men and women in attendance, but the handful that I've done that has been just women is just it, the difference is extraordinary and surprising. And so after I, I just finished a year long summit with a big corporate group, that was all women. I came home and I'm like, we got to do this for the horse women, you know, like, and so that, you know, that, and Sinead walked onto the property for the first one and was like, I can't believe how comfortable I am. Mm. Like, you know, like, so, so we're looking at how energy, our energy impacts everything. And a lot of the work that I've done in the corporate world over the last 10 years has been on energy for the company that I worked with. And my mentor was really a master at energy, talking about energy, managing energy. And so we're going to look at how our energy impacts our horses, our performance, our behavior, our emotions, and especially our confidence and our ability to connect. Um, well, awesome. I, that's <laughs> so wonderful. I got a lot to think about. Like I'm looking forward to listening to this podcast again and, uh, and soaking in everything that you said. <laughs> so um, where can people find you? It's super easy. It's uh, www.drjenny.com. Just drjenny.com. It's pretty easy. Um, and we, you know, uh, I'm easy. I'm on Facebook, Dr. Jenny Susser. Um, <clears throat> and if you Google me, I, I show up in mostly appropriate spots. You're Googleable, mostly appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone's going to start Googling now. <laughs> right? <laughs> the inappropriate ones. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Curiosity is a good, you know. Good quality. Yeah. Right? Clickbait. Anyway. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate this. That was that was a lot of good stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Thanks for always having me. And uh, I always enjoy talking with you. Excellent. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.